Welcome everybody. This is a recording of a talk on analog computers. It's a revised version of my talk that I did at the Sprung meeting on December 20th, 2022. First things first, I'd like to thank Hans van Bommel for the invitation. And I'd like to thank Dr. Bernd Ullmann, the wonderful analog computer evangelist, for sharing huge amounts of information on the subject. His books and web pages on analog computers and the extensive email replies were the main source of this talk. The following topics will be covered in this talk. What is an analog computer and why analog? What are the properties of an analog computer? A little history on analog computers. The talk will be about electronic analog computers what standard components or modules can be found in an electronic analog computer. A simple example shows how to program and operate an analog computer. Where are we now when it comes to analog computers and what will the future bring us? Looking back on the history of electronic analog computers, we will see that the first ones were built in the 1940s evolved to helpful machines in the 1960s and the 1970s and then completely disappeared in the 1980s. So why should this talk be relevant? Today, or more in general the 2020s, these machines are coming back, but this time in a contemporary outfit. Several companies are developing their own analog computer on a chip. That's because we need them in the near future. But first, what is an analog computer? If you're over 60 years young and had some technical education, you probably had to do your serious math calculations with a slide rule. The slide rule is an example of a very basic mechanical analog computer. This talk is about its electronic versatile sister. So when I'm talking about analog computers, I'm mainly talking about the uh, electronic analog computer. But to explain what an analog computer is, it's better to focus on an old mechanical one first. In 1872, Sir William Thompson, also known as, or better known as Lord Kelvin, developed the first harmonic synthesizer, a specialized analog computer for generating harmonics and adding these two together to generate a tight prediction. This machine took 10 partial tights into account. The picture shown is a compact build of a tight predictor. The next picture shows the design of the tight predictor by Lord Kelvin. Now this tight predicting machine was a special purpose mechanical analog computer constructed and set up to predict the ebb and flow of sea tides and the irregular variations in their heights. The tides change in mixtures of rhythms that never repeat themselves exactly. It is important for ships porting or leaving a harbor to know the tides for individual harbors. Lord Kelvin designed a machine that could be set up for a specific location and a specific time of year and produce the correct sea tide. And we call it an analog computer because there is an analogy in the sea tide behavior or the height of the water level at the harbor and the behavior of Lord Kelvin's machine. In case of this tide predictor, the results of the machine are plotted on paper. These plots are the tides for a given harbor at a specific time. Using this machine, it took only four hours to compute the 1400 tides that occur during a year for a given harbor. Performing the same task manually took several months. On 9 October 1943, the Liverpool Tidal Institute received its most challenging task to date to calculate the optimal day and hour of the largest amphibian invasion in history at Normandy's notoriously unpredictable coastline. For this task, they still used the mechanical tidal predictor designed by Lord Kelvin. Moving ahead in time and going electric. 
Here we have a picture of an electronic analog computer. It's a Telefunken RA770, a machine from 1970, but more on that later. The electronic analog computer is a machine where its internal structure is not fixed. It's a machine for solving mathematical problems by changing its structure in a suitable way to generate a model, a so-called analog of the problem. This analog is then used to analyze or simulate the problem to be solved. So what it won't do are things like running word processors, databases or web browsers. It's all about a knowledge of a problem that has to be solved, studied, presented, whatever. The analogies can be direct or indirect. A direct analogy is where the model is based on the same principle as the underlying problem. An indirect analogy is where the setup of an analog computer bears no direct resemblance of the problem. An indirect analogy is where the setup of an analog computer bears no direct resemblance of the problem to be solved. There will be a much higher degree of abstraction. A thorough mathematical description of the basic problem is required for, as a precondition for programming an analog computer. A direct analogy, for example, is a wind tunnel experiment on a wing of a plane. An indirect analogy is the same experiment done with the theoretical mathematics set up in an electronic analog computer. The difference between the physical principle and the model is the scaling of the model. The model set up in an analog computer will work with values between minus one and plus one. The physical principle can be very small, like atomic scale, or very large, like cosmic scale. Also, the time variable has to be scaled. The physical principle can take very little or very long time. Scaling the analog computer setup is often the hardest issue to tackle. The structure of an analog computer that has been set up to work on a specific problem represents the problem itself. An ordinary digital computer operates in a program controlled manner by means of an algorithm. It performs individual steps one at a time. An analog computer does not know any step-by-step -step execution. Here, all computing elements operate in parallel. A digital computer with a stored program keeps its structure. Its program and used data are changed. Nevertheless, the level of abstraction required for the successful application of analog computers is still relatively small compared with the algorithmic approach of stored program digital computers. Last but not least, analog computers are models. The models are programmed by patching, connecting mathematical operations, the different modules, with patch cables to create a model. The picture shows many patch panels. This way it's easy to program a model without direct need of the analog computer. An analog operator can then connect the panel to the analog computer set all the dials as requested by the programmer and run the machine. Due to the fact that analog computers work by acting as a model for a given problem, the amount of circuitry necessary for a simulation is determined by the complexity of the underlying problem. Accordingly, analog computers are not capable of the trade-off between time to solution on one end and complexity of the underlying problem on the other, what we have with start program digital computers. This is both a curse and a blessing. The curse being that an analog computer consisting of a given number of computing elements cannot solve a problem that requires more computing elements. The blessing is that the time to solution on an analog computer is more or less constant and it's not related to the size of the underlying problem. So simply put, for big problems you need big analog computers. But the time to solution is not dependent on the size of the problem or the analog computer. Some classic problem areas, especially those found in aerospace and applications in the chemical industry, 
require well over a thousand computing elements, resulting in substantial, if not giant, analog computers. In addition to this, the stored program computer can always exchange compute time for position, something an analog computer also cannot normally do. The precision of an analog computer is given by its particular implementation and typically does not exceed about three to four decimal places for the variables involved in the computation. An analog computer does have a disadvantage for those who are used to high precision of digital computers and calculators. For those who are used to high precision of digital computers and calculators, an analog computer as a serious drawback. You don't use an analog computer for summing series or precise number calculations. But it's great for like feedback systems, easing finding parameters to stabilize a chaos system. Also feedback systems like flight control, plotting and analyzing a set of coupled differential equations. For me, the strong point of an analog computer is that it's easy to change and tweak the parameters of a computation and get the, an immediate result. If the program is a model of a chaos system, it's easy to find the conditions in which the system is stable or unstable. Finding boundary conditions for partial differential equations can be found this way. Finding the desired parameters can be done by hand, but even easier with a hybrid system. In case of chaos systems, the digital computer sets all the possible parameters runs a program for every possible situation and tests the output whether the system is stable or not. This way the digital part can automatically create a domain for parameters in which the tested system is stable. An analog computer is not precise on exact calculations, but working with continuous values, it has no discrete steps between these values. So it's very good in coping with small fluctuations. An example of differences between flowing analog and discrete digital, we are going to look at different situations for the Rustler Attractor. The Rustler Attractor is a continuous time dynamical system with chaotic behavior. This system is described by three coupled differential equations. The focus here will be on the resulting plots of the four different situations. The first picture shows a plot of the Rustler attractor produced with all and only analog equipment. It's a fluent continuous line with different intensity. The intensity is a consequence of the speed of the point moving in the plot. The second picture is also a nice plot of a Rustler attractor, but now with slightly different parameters. This time the plot is done on a mediocre Chinese oscilloscope. Although the vector or draw a line from point to point option was enabled, it still only plotted a series of points. Better oscilloscopes will draw nice lines and only the very expensive ones will draw a correct intensity of a line segment. For my noise machine projects, I wrote some software that could simulate an analog computer and send its output via MIDI to my home-built electronic sound machines. Equations for different chaotic systems, being oscillators and attractors, are coded into the application. The parameters are controlled by a MIDI control. And here we see a plot that should look like a nice plot of a Rustler attractor, but looks if it's corrupt. It's a collection of straight lines uh, going everywhere. It has to do with the discrete steps in the calculations where very, very fine time steps are needed. The plot is jumping in all directions and even with a two microsecond time scale. If you pick the right parameters, you will end up with a good looking stable attractor system or an oscillator. Scaling a system in a minus one to plus one range and finding the desired and matching parameters is often the hardest work of an analog computer programmer. And here, a digital computer can be of great help with both challenges. Scaling is often algebra. Finding the better parameters sometimes done with a try and error feedback. Finding a specific parameter can also be the target of the model. Finding parameters for a model is often done with a hybrid computer. It's a digital computer operating the analog one, where the digital one will set the parameters 
initialize the analog computer operate it and hold it and read the analog one so the repetitive sequence is setting parameters initializing the integrators going into operation mode when the calculation is done going in halt mode and reading the results in my setup the midi controller is a bcr 2000 which can be seen here this thing is great for setting and on the fly changing parameters in the analog computer simulation application. A big drawback is the MIDI resolution. MIDI values are mainly 7 bits, which means there are only 128 unique steps in the rotary knob. So in my software I use at least one rotary knob for course and one for fine tuning and sometimes even a third for finer fine tuning. What are the properties of an analog computer? Well, an analog computer operates on continuous values, so not step-by-step -step operation. It has a range of values limited by the so-called machine unit. Contemporary analog computers work from minus 10 volts up to plus 10 volts and old vacuum tube ones at ranges from minus 100 volt up to plus 100 volt. The analog computer is inherently parallel and tops nearly every digital computer in this respect. Power consumption is very low for the modern ones. It's about a factor 100 times lower than digital counterparts. It has a quite limited precision, but it works continuous and not discrete. Limited means a three digit precision on my home build system. It's a perfect match for solving scientific and engineering problems, which can be described by differential equations. Now a little history on analog computers. Although the focus of this talk is on electronic analog computers, I will now jump many centuries back in time and tell a bit on mechanical ones. A quote. Analog computers were the most powerful computers for thousands of years. I started this talk with a slide rule and the tide predictor, but there are much older tools that we know of. More than 120 years ago in 1900, sponge divers found a lump of corroded gears in a Roman wreck, which carried treasures from Greece dating back to about 100 BC. It turned out that these were the remains of one of the most complicated mechanical and mathematical devices ever. Due to its location near the Greek island Antikythera, this impressive machine became known as the Antikythera mechanism. This mechanism is displayed in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The piece and its inner workings was investigated and it turned out that the Antikythera mechanism was ahead of its time by at least 1000 years. The device modeled movements of several celestial bodies, even taking into account various anomalies, which required differential gears and much more complicated epicyclic gearing. This intricate mechanism allowed the calculation of the sun and the moon positions at given dates, phases of the moon, and the prediction of solar and lunar eclipses. The implementation of these functions required more than 30 gears, manufactured with extraordinary precision. Now, jumping back in time and going electric, the first experiments with electronic analog computing started just before halfway the 20th century. An electronic analog computer needs electronic amplifiers. At the beginning, these were vacuum tubes. The first electronic analog computers were still dedicated problem solvers. In, it's uh, 1935 and we're in Germany where Helmut Hussler wanted to calculate the through ground speed of an aircraft. And he had realized that using electronic circuits, mathematical operations like integration and differentiation could be easily built. Unfortunately, his ideas were neglected. Mathematicians wanted to solve complex problems by pure thought, not with the help of electronic devices. At that time, most electronic devices were radios. When World War II broke out, Hussler worked as an engineer for Telefunken, and there he was approached by Werner von Braun and asked to help with the development of the A4 rocket. Here Hussler was set to work on the radio guidance system for the new rocket. 
This time Hussler was able to realize his ideas and work on an analog guidance computer. Parallel to his work and initially unnoticed by his supervisors, Hussler started to work on a fully electronic, general-purpose analog computer. Again, he was confronted with many objections and prejudice of other people. He was forced to stop working on that new machine by his supervisor. So further development was continued, but in secrecy. When completed, it proved to be a valuable tool and played a central role in the development of the A4 rocket. The first general purpose electronic analog computer was born. General as general can be for analog computing, it could integrate and differentiate arbitrary functions. Left on the slide is the picture that shows Hustler's analog computer as found after the war. Only two of those computers were finally built one of which was brought to the United States where it was used until 1955. That machine is shown here. On the right is the schematic drawing of an integrator from Hussler's machine. Hussler's general purpose machine was relatively small and as told before, large problems require large analog computers. Here we see a larger analog computer from just after World War II. It's a GPN 2000 from 1949. Later on I will show that an electronic analog computer has a limited number of components. For the programmer these components are nothing more than composable mathematical operations or functions. For the engineer these operations and functions are easy to build. In the beginning the main parts were summers, integrators and buffered coefficient potentiometers. For this you needed only three designs and you could build as many of the distinctive parts as you needed. Special function generators were also used. These are the more complex parts, but building a large stable power supply was probably the most challenging part of building this analog computer. This picture shows the big aerospace system at Buklau from the beginning of the 1960s. Three large patch panels can be seen. These are detachable patch panels one of the better inventions regarding to analog computers for that time. As told before, a mathematician can patch his program at his own desk and not use the expensive computer while being idle. The operator can click on the patch panel, set the dials and operate the analog computer. In the end, we want to see results. If it's a calculation, the output can be a single value on a meter, plots on an oscilloscope screen, screen photos or films from that oscilloscope screen or pen plots. If it's a simulation, the analog computer can read controllers and feedback to the, some other hardware. In this picture, we see a EAI 8800 system from the late 1960s. The left side of the picture shows a pen plotter and some output screens. It also has multiple meters for reading single values. At the start of this talk I mentioned Dr. Bernd Ullmann. This is his living room. Here he's working with his favorite hybrid analog computer, a 550 kg high precision Telefunken RA770. Dr. Bernd Ullmann is a mathematician and in 2009 he did his doctorate, Fascination with Analog Computing. He started to collect analog computers, write books on the history of analog computers and how they were built, how they work and how to work with them. At that time there was no one building and or selling general purpose electronic analog computers. Bernd decided to develop, build and sell his own analog computer. The Analog Paradigm Model 1 was developed and produced and in 2019 the world could buy his computer. This model is sold mainly to universities for educational purposes. Bernd told me that some model ones were sold to research and development departments of commercial companies. He politely asked them what their models once will be used for, but there came no answer. In 2020, Dr. Bernd Unman, Dr. Sven Köppel and Lars Heimann started the company Anna Brit. Their main goal is to develop an analog computer on a chip, this for high performance analog computing in hybrid systems. So a hybrid analog computer on a chip next to a CPU, GPU and other coprocessors. Later on, some more on the future of analog computing.
they still sell the analog paradigm model one and in 2021 they developed that that is short for the analog thing an affordable analog computer for educational purposes this is done before here we see an educational heat kit ec1 yes it's a kit it's from the early 60s working with plus and minus 60 volts that are voltages that will bite you it only had nine operational amplifiers and could only do summing integration and comparing values at that time in 1960 everyone could buy their own computer for 400 us dollars back to the corona years and to the birth of that it started as and now again everyone can buy their own analog computer for 300 euros made in china alas the china production was very unreliable with many dead or very crippled on arrival and then the world ran out of chips today it's not only a german designed but also a german built computer having told that as of today that will sell for just over 500 euros Building analog computers, or more specific, building that, seems to be a difficult and challenging task. Even the German manufacturer has over 50% of its production with issues. At the moment just over 200 have been shipped and another 700 are ordered. That is an open source project and lots of people are building soft and hardware tools for it. As far as I can see, this is the largest community of analog computerists. A smaller group are the analog computer thinkers, the girls and boys who know how to use a soldering iron. These are the ones that build their own electronic analog computer modules just for the fun of it. This pile of colorful enclosures is my home built system. I started with the gray enclosure on the top at around 2012. That computer has been changed and updated three times. The other three modules, the green, the black and another rainbow, have been built in the last three years. I made the system myself so it has the parts and modules I wanted in my analog computer. A decent control unit, many multipliers, enough coefficient potentiometers, precision reference voltages, enough comparators including analog switches not the inaccurate mechanical relays why did i build it why analog computers well back to 1983 and back to school even more back in the 70s itachi was the preferred supplier of analog computers for technical colleges in the netherlands as far as i know they were mainly model 200 machines in 1980, my middle or high school, whatever, in Dutch, the Philips van Horne Scholengemeenschap, started a computer club run by students and supervised and mentored by a math and a physics teacher. I knew that the physics teacher had lots of connections with technical colleges and technical universities. So one day I entered the club room and out of the blue there it was, as if it was just dropped there with a kind of time machine the Hitachi 550E. I don't know for sure, but I still think the machine was donated by a technical college. Unfortunately, the physics teacher passed away recently, so I can't ask him anymore. What I do know is that the physics teacher knew what it was and how to work it. But the rest of us, nobody had any idea what to do with it. How you could turn it on, how to program it. Didn't even work, nobody knew. And it was never turned on, let alone tested. According to the sales brochure, the amplifiers work in a range of from minus 100 to plus 100 volt. Maybe that's the reason why it wasn't used. We were not allowed to play with that machine and its ridiculous voltages. But the huge machine intrigued me enormously. Well, a long story short, in 1978, I was into analog electronics and very interested in modular synths. In 1983 the Hitachi 550E was dropped into my life, so to say. In 2006 I started as an artist. Still into electronics I was building ugly gadgets. 
but I also painted beautiful organic images. So I changed from painting to building a huge pile of crappy noisy machines and started that in 2011. In 2012, via the web, I came across Bernd's uh, pages on analog computers. I was curious about those analog computers and started to build my first one. In 2020, building the rest of my current uh, analog computer setup and 2022, this talk. That's more than enough on the history for now. Standard computing elements. What standard components or modules can be found in an electronic analog computer? Building a general purpose analog computer. The main active component of an analog computer is the operational amplifier. An operational amplifier, or op-amp for short, is a DC coupled high gain electronic voltage amplifier with a differential input, plus and minus sides, and a single ended output. DC coupled means direct current. In this case, it means that the amplifier can handle signals with slow or rapid changing values, but it will also correctly work with stable or fixed value signals. The needs for an electronic analog computer are, and the wanted parts are ideal operational amplifiers with infinite input impedance, with infinite gain, and with no drift. In reality, we have the real-life operational amplifiers with non-zero input impedance, but it can be high, well over 1 mega ohms, with non-infinite gain, but still very high, with amplification factors of 10 to the power 12. And the op amps drift, but that can be stabilized and minimized. The analog computer has some standard computing elements. Some basic computing elements are coefficient potentiometers for setting initial values or scale amplification, parameter setting. There are summers for just adding values. The integrator, including control of initial conditions and operation, they integrate a value over time. Because of how an upper amp works, the output of a summer and integrator is negated. Plus in, minus out, minus in, plus out. With an extra op amp, this could easily be undone, but that's not done. An extra op amp will reduce the precision of the computing element. With the negated output, the negative results are also available. The electronic analog computer uses integrators instead of differentiators. The way an integrator is built makes it suppress noise. With a differentiator, the parts will amplify the noise. Every analog computer has some kind of control for initializing and starting, stopping the integrators. This is done by a control unit. It will handle the needs of the integrator and it can be set to one or endless runs. More basic computing parts are multipliers or other dedicated functions. Comparators, these are the if-thens for analog computers. They compare values. The comparator has two inputs. If the sum of the two is smaller than zero, it will result in a plus one output. If it's larger than zero, it will result in a minus one output. And almost never precisely zero, which will result in a zero output. Building a usable multiplier with electronic components was a serious challenge. Today we have high quality multiplier chips and these are the most expensive chips in an analog computer. The cheaper ones cost about 20 euros, but more serious precise ones will cost around 100 euros, even more. The high quality op amps used in the Model 1 are even today less than 10 euros. And more basic computer parts are dedicated function generators or function models, like generating a sine wave or applying a sine function on a signal, Often used are coordinate converters, converting between Cartesian and polar coordinates. Furthermore, there are noise generators, mostly with sample and hold modules. These are used in Monte Carlo simulations. And as a last one, time delay units. A better look at a general purpose analog computer. At the right is the Donier 230 general purpose analog computer and at the left, the simulator. The simulator is built as a more dedicated analog computer, but has the parts 
and can be used as a general purpose analog computer. Donier was well known as a German airplane company and the simulator was marketed as an analog computer for all kinds of aircraft simulations. And yes, the airplane company built and sold their own computers. Here we focus on the patch panel. This is where the model is programmed by patching from one computing element to another. At the top of the panel you can connect to the coefficient potentiometers. Here we focus on those coefficient potentiometers. This machine also has a small patch panel with logic, boolean logic, true and false, and with AND, OR and exclusive OR functions. At the bottom is the control unit for operating the machine. It also has a voltage meter. Via the patch panel it can be connected to a computing element. With a rotary switch it's possible to connect it to a coefficient potentiometer and read its current value. Next a picture of an old analog oscilloscope. Nowadays still the best device to monitor the output of an analog computer. Here a modern digital oscilloscope. This version is ideal for analog computers, but alas, they cost more than a big analog computer setup. Price is the main reason I don't use this beautiful machine. It will cost me about 10,000 euros. The vintage 1980s analog oscilloscope I use cost me 60 euros. The results of analog computer calculations are mostly slow enough for a simple data logger. Later on I will show you one that has 8 input channels, a trigger channel, so it can detect the start of a run and was built for less than 60 euros. And the fun part for me was that I had to build it myself. Now let's see how to program an analog computer with a simple example. Simple for those who understand some basic physics and mathematics. The hello world. A minimal analog computer program patch is nothing more than one integrator with its output controlled with a coefficient potentiometer fed back as input. This is an analogy for exponential decay like radioactive decay. For me this is a quick test for new built integrators. But also my first analog computer patch was this simple one. Like my first program lines, more complex than hello world. Both occasions gave me lots of joy and inspiration. According to myself, creating a sine wave is the hello world for analog computers. You only need two integrators and one inverter for the setup. But according to Dr. Bernd Ullmann, the mass spring damper system is the hello world for analog computing. In this example, the control unit and the three most common computing elements are used. So the programming steps are make a calculation plan, convert the equations into a computer setup, normalize the setup and determine the time scale, patch the setup and activate the analog computer. Next shown is step by step from the physics to the formulas to the setup of an analog computer to how to work such a problem. The term programming when it refers to an analog computer implies the proper configuration and wiring of the analog elements of the analog computer. This in such a way that it can simulate the behavior described by the set of equations. The mass spring damper system. We start with a blank canvas and there is a mass connected to the ceiling with a spring and the damper under the mass standing on the floor. The mass has value m, the spring has a spring factor s, the damper had a damping factor of d. The movement of the system will only be vertical and its distance is expressed by y. The gravitational force on mass m is fm, directed downwards. The added forces from the spring and the damper are fs and fd and result to an upward force. Next the formulas. With the help of Newton's second law, the gravitational force on the mass is expressed with force is mass times acceleration. And acceleration is the second derivative of the displacement distance over time. 
In this example, the direction of the force is down. The force of the spring is the spring constant times its displacement distance. The force of the damper is the damper constant times the first derivative of the displacement distance over time. And in this example, the direction of the spring and the damper forces are up. With the help of Newton's third law, the sum of all forces equals zero. And with some algebra, we can separate the highest degree derivative from the rest. Now we can design our analog computer setup. Again, we start with a blank canvas. Working with integrators as the inverse of a differentiator, we start with the second derivative of y. As told before, summers and integrators negate the output. We add an initial condition for the integrator. We need a positive initial condition here, and it's scaled with the coefficient potentiometer C1. Next integrator will create y from the negated first derivative of y. This integrator also needs an initial condition. Now a negative one, and it's scaled with coefficient potentiometer C2. We do need a positive value for the first derivative of y. This is done by adding a summer with just one input that will negate the input. This is also called an inverter. Most analog computers have dedicated inverters available as modules. The y value from the second integrator is led to an output gate. With an oscilloscope, this value can be presented. Also, the y value is scaled to the value of F s times y. This is the spring force, Fs. The first derivative, y, is scaled with the value d times the first derivative of y. This is the damper force, Fd. Now with the summer, the spring force and the damper force are added and negated. The coefficient potentiometer C5 will scale that negated sum. Now we have all the values we need for the equation for the mass spring damper system. And with Kelvin's feedback technique, we create a feedback loop. Now the second derivative of y is equal to the formula we found before with the help of Newton's third law and some algebra. That's it. Now patch this model and put it to work. With analog computers, big problems need big computers and small problems need small computers. This mass spring damper system is a hello world small problem so I patched it on my smallest analog computer, that, the analog thing. The output of that is coupled to a data logger. This measure device sent its recorded data set to a laptop. With a suitable application, it presents the recorded voltages over time. And if we start that, this is some output. A mass spring damper simulation with some initial settings. Again, but now with a higher spring constant. A next one with higher spring and damper constants. This plot shows that certain settings can produce unstable system. Also, the analog computer is never a theoretical perfect device. In the setup, there is no indication of an external force added to create the out of bound oscillations. This out-of-control-like situation is due to imperfections in the practical system. Here we used Kelvin feedback to set up the analog computer elements. There are other methods based on mathematical tricks like substitution method. Since an analog computer can only use time as the free variable of integration, partial differential equations are normally solved by either employing a quotient of differences approach or by separation of variables. Here are some images of screen dumps of different patches running on my home built analog computer system. This Hindmarsh and Rose model describes the behavior of neurons and it consists of three coupled differential equations, all very theoretical. In this case, my cheap Owen does produce a nice screen dump. Most oscilloscopes have two input channels, 
the more expensive ones have four. The advantage of logging data from most analog computers patches is that it can be done with relative low speeds. So every thinkerer will buy some cheap but still fast microcontroller board with decent analog inputs and build a slow speed data logger. Popular is the TNC4 series microcontroller boards, which is affordable, fast and has two separate analog input controllers and eight analog inputs. The microcontroller logs the signal from the coupled analog computer and sends data via USB to a laptop or PC. With this home built data logger I also needed to write my own data processing and presentation software. My version will do time based plots, XY plots and two channel spectrum plots. And here are some images. An Euler spiral is a clotoid and display a significant role in road and railway track construction. A safe curve in a road has a curvature that starts at zero, rises to a maximum and then falls back to zero again. This plot was used to test the spectrum plot function. It's a data of some seconds of stereo audio track. This video shows a slow time plot on an old analog oscilloscope. It's the plot of a Lorentz attractor, Elegant Chaos. A critical observer will notice that the points plotted are not nice round and small points or line fragments floating in the direction of the Lorentz attractor plot. At this stage my home built analog computer had some minor design flaws that introduced small but noticeable and unwanted oscillations. The mistakes were small and easy to remove. Now my system is working as intended with minimal noise. Now a video of a fast time plot of the same Lorentz attractor setup. Setting a speed is done with the speed selection at the integrators. With coefficient potentiometers the input on an integrator can be fine tuned. Most vintage analog oscilloscopes have no memory function. They will only plot one point per channel. Here is a photo of an oscilloscope screen plotting the points of a Lorentz attractor. The photo is made with a long shutter speed, so the series of line fragments form this butterfly shape. The Owen is capable of storing screen dumps. Here we see a collection of single frames forming a time-lapse video. Every next frame is created by just tweaking some parameter just a bit. In the end the parameters are set in such a way that the system is nothing more than a single but stable point. Where are we now when it comes to analog computers? At Enerbrit they are designing an analog computer on a chip. This as a classic coprocessor. Its integration into digital computers will yield powerful general purpose and special purpose hybrids. Meanwhile they developed their own Model 1, a serious hybrid general purpose analog computer. The analog thing, that, is a high quality, low cost, open source and not for profit cutting edge hybrid enabled analog computer available to individuals and educational institutions. Most of the old analog computers can now be found in museums. The biggest collection can be found at Dr. Bernd Unman's museum. He is not only a collector, if possible he will get them all in working order. There are a lot of computer and technic museums that have vintage, mechanical and electric analog computers on display. Other people I know that own vintage analog computers are all using them in an electronic music setup. In the 1970s the Hitachi 240 was the analog computer on technical colleges in the Netherlands. One of them ended up in Dr. Bernd Ullmann's museum. Two of them ended up by musician Hans Kulk, who later donated them to Wilm II Studios in Den Bosch. Those two, a lot of other vintage electronic measuring equipment and an analog mixer is now used to create electronic music. In another room there is a studio with all vintage analog synthesizers. Both rooms can be rented by musicians. 
Hans Kull can help you if you like to use the analog computers. The electronics for an electronic analog computer is quite simple. Most parts are cheap and still widely available. Only a multiplier chip is relatively expensive. There's lots of free documentation on the web and lots of support by the community. So for those who like to build their own machine, it's not expensive, quite easy to build and there's enough documentation and help. For me, building my own analog computer is a big part of the fun. So now, what will the future bring us? The near future of analog computers. Looking back one more time on the history of electronic analog computers, we saw that the first ones were built in the 1940s, evolved to hybrid machines in the 1960s and 70s, and then completely disappeared in the 1980s. And now, this time, these machines are coming back back in a contemporary outfit. Several companies are developing their analog computer on a chip. That's because we need them in the near future. Looking on the web on the subject of analog computers. There is a great video by Veritasium on YouTube titled The Most Powerful Computers You've Never Heard Of. Found on the Mythic website. Analog AI, it sounds crazy, but it might be the future. And this company is developing dedicated analog computing chips for AI purposes. They are working on compute in memory hardware. Analog computing provides the ultimate compute in a memory processing element. In my early days of programming for simple 8-bit computers, I did a lot of assembly language programming. That's programming almost directly with the language of the chip itself. If you did it right, you could write faster and much smaller code than the compilers available. In those early days, computers were slow and had very little memory. Most of the programmers that used this way of writing their code discovered that over 80% of the code is reading from or writing to memory, just moving data and sometimes doing nothing else with it. Contemporary digital computers and devices still do a lot of just moving data. So indeed, compute in memory, instead of mainly moving bits and bytes, is a great idea. For Mythic, analog computing provides the ultimate compute in memory processing element. Their analog computer makes compute in memory to an extreme, where the system computes directly inside the memory array itself. This is possible by using the memory elements as tunable resistors, supplying the inputs as voltages and collecting the outputs as currents. And this is not a sequential process like reading a set of data from memory, but it is a continuous process. For those interested, Mythic uses analog computing for core neural network matrix operations. The operation is multiplying an input vector by a weight matrix. Analog computing provides several key advantages for Mythic. It is amazingly efficient, it eliminates memory movement, parallel reading of resistors instead of sequential memory reads, it is high performance, there are hundreds of thousands of multiply accumulate operations occurring in parallel working on one of these vector operations. And as far as I understand, it's still energy efficient. It's a hybrid system and there are still digital components at work. Also, there are many digital to analog and analog to digital converters in their compute in memory system. But the number of memory elements is squared to the number of digital analog converters and analog digital converters. The digital to analog and the analog to digital converters can be energy efficient Digital to analog converter with R2R networks, these are resistor networks that convert without using extra power, probably are very energy efficient. Alas, I could only read about their bright ideas and observe only the compute in memory diagram. I did not see any chips or other hardware. Furthermore, their take on analog computing is not general purpose but a dedicated system. There are actual general purpose analog computer on a chip, chips, at Sendine, Sensing Modeling Control. At their research and development department, they are working on a general purpose analog computer on a chip. 
Here again, not an image of the actual hardware, but some design image of the evaluation board. It has two interconnected Apollo analog computer ICs. They each provide 16 integrators. The board can interface to a digital computer through high-speed serial interface. I have seen two research papers with actual results of the evaluation board. They also tested the Hello World Mars Spring Damper System. Programming the Apollo is done with the help of digital software. The Sendine R&D team used Legno, which was developed by MIT. In this setup, the compiler determines the optimum scaling coefficients for each basic unit. These coefficients are shown in green. The setup is not drawn by man, but by Legno. A user just writes down a simple script. The first steps is to input the equations into the compiler. The code describing them is straightforward. This code describes the equations along with their initial conditions, the validity range for each variable and the time interval desired, and it instructs the compiler to output the position as an analog variable. For example, the second line of code. This expression evaluates to a function p as an integral of function v with an initial condition of 9.0. The Legno compiler is a valuable asset to the SA100 system board. It parses scripts and those scripts are simple and easy to write. The Legno compiler selects the basic general purpose analog computer units and creates the full and correct setup. It scales signals for optimum analog operation. The analog computer programmer, the human able to make mistakes, doesn't have to do that anymore. It will route the connection on the Apollo chip or chips and it will let the system run. At the moment, the only analog computer for serious research and development or simulation work is the analog paradigm model one. With this model, you still need to patch wiring up the system by hand. Also, there is no patch panel on the Model 1. Every new analog computer model needs a new patch, being a lot of work and thereby a lot of time. A lot of time, the computer is not working. The hybrid operation with this analog computer is challenging to set up. As far as I know, it's still done with Perl scripts and there is no user-friendly GUI Debugging can be time consuming. In some cases, mispatching can destroy parts of the system. You have to know the do's and don'ts. The system has protection parts, but it's not monkey proof. There's also the issue of ESD, short for electrostatic discharges, on the inputs and outputs of the system. Accidentally giving the input of a multiplier an electrostatic shock can become expensive. Research and development labs are shockingly famous for their bad ESD situation. Today's systems like the Model 1 and that have protection components at their in and outputs. Those protection components do a wonderful job, but they can't protect every mis-event and even, but rarely, they get damaged themselves. A fun fact is the old vacuum tube analog computers were completely insensitive for ESD. In the 80s, cruise missiles still used them for missile control because they would not fail after an electromagnetic pulse generated by an enemy or some other exploding nu nuclear bomb. The last company I'm going to cover here is Anabrit. Anabrit is the merge of analog and hybrid. Regarding the future, I will focus on the development of a general purpose analog computer on a chip. Because of production issues and chip shortages, most of their time and energy these days is put into the analog thing. As far as I know and have been told, at the moment the chip is more an idea than a real working product. According to Dr. Bernd Ullmann, the energy efficient analog computer on a chip is the future. It is not magic, but instead within reach. For realization, he founded Anabrit together with the visionaries from various industries. The problem with conventional digital computers is that they consume too much energy and run up against physical boundaries. Classical computing has reached an end. 
there is need of fresh ideas for high performance computing. This is also true for energy efficient computing. Digital computing, which is well suited for algorithmic symbol processing in discrete steps, is less suited to model continuous relationships efficiently. By incorporating thousands of analog computing elements operated at scale under digital control, the analog computer on a chip will complement digital technology. If necessary, the best of two worlds. These hybrids can be very small, as in smartwatches, or even smaller, and extremely large, as in supercomputers. In current research, the analog computer on a chip chips are not extended with a digital CPU or microcontroller unit. If the general purpose analog computers chips are developed and come available, it probably won't take long for development of a combination, a hybrid on a very small chip. About two years ago, Bernd Ullmann started working on the general purpose analog computer on a chip. He saw that his idea was possible, lots of parts of the chip already exist. At the time, he needed two years and a team of 10 to 15 experts to make this goal come true. Alas, shame about the trouble with the analog thing. But the ID will be here forever. Bernd's dream and goal is to build an analog computer that is faster than any digital computer and consumes only a minimum of energy. The actual innovation is to put the analog computer on a chip and the possibility of programming the analog computer with the help of a digital one. The goal is to develop an analog computer on a chip no bigger than a few square millimeters in size like we saw with the Apollo chip. It will be a quantum leap that revolutionizes signal processing in mobile phones or medical implants. Thank you for your attention and happy analog computing.